Well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is Melanie Sykes. Now, Melanie perhaps doesn't need much introduction. She's a, a famous face from the television and media industry. Um, but recently, uh, Melanie has brought out a new book, uh, Illuminated, which I've got here and read and, and keep dipping back into. Melanie, it's absolutely brilliant to get you on the Godcast. How are you doing? I'm really good, darling. I'm really, really good. And I'm glad you like my book. Yeah, definitely. Now, you've got that beautiful northern accent, but you, you live in you live in the south. Where, whereabouts are you based? You're based in the city now, or I'm in North I'm in North London. Um, I moved here in 1989. And so I've lived down south longer than I've lived up north, but um it doesn't change who I am and what I am and that northern spirit that I possess. It just is inbuilt, isn't it, in those very formative years? And I'm proud of that. When when I met you briefly at a publishing event, you said you miss it. What what is it? What is the difference? Because I've never lived in the south. What what would you say it is? I've noticed it more recently that there is less hostility in the air up north. Um, and although I do find wonderful people everywhere I walk, the atmosphere is distinctly different up north. Now, I, again, don't want to be general about up north, but when I saw you, I, I was in Manchester specifically, and that city is showing people the way on how a city should be and feel because it's joyful and mm. people fall over themselves to help you. Yeah. And they speak to you on an even keel and they're not fishing for anything. It's just a natural state of wanting to be of service. And that's me all over. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I um, Because Manchester is my nearest city, it's where we head. But, but recently in the last 12 months, I spent quite a bit of time in Liverpool and I, and I found exactly the same vibe there. Oh, you know I've what? always found that in Liverpool. I mean, yeah. I love Liverpool. <laughs> I don't go there enough either. And every time I've been, I've had so much fun and there's been so much joy and humour. Humour. <laughs> what happened to having some humour just in everyday life and just laugh at some of the atrocities and atrocious stuff that's going on? There's no harm in finding the humour in pain. Yeah. And you get taken down for laughing in the face of it as if you don't care. But that's part of being human is having to process it in a way that is palatable and doesn't hurt too much. I mean, I was brought up on Coronation Street at a time where everybody was speaking their minds and speaking their truths, especially women. Mm -hmm. And the laughter that came from all those dramatic storylines that did actually reflect real life. I don't watch soaps anymore, so I don't really know. So I'm not up on it. But um, there is something to set, be said for that natural humour that mm. is born in the North. Melanie, I, uh, our, our pathways are very, very different. But reading your book, uh, I see quite a lot of similarities. You just talked about those Coronation Street women. And, and I was brought up on exactly those things as well. You know, the, the Vera Duckworths and the... Uh, the Bet Lynch's of this world. And, and Eni Sharples. I mean, I'm going back because I am I think I'm older than you, but like Eni Sharples. Yeah. And was, these and these women, uh, these women are, um, they're still around, I think, in in certainly in the, the northern towns of Lancashire, you know, the Burnleys and the Blackburns. Those <laughs> those women are still around and, and they are characters. Just talking on, on sense of humour, Melanie, we'll talk about some of the adversity that you've been through and the, the challenges in, in your life. How, how important has a sense of humour been to your own kind of story? Oh, I mean, I seek out joy. I actually describe myself as a joy seeker and, and there has always been a, a derogatory feeling towards joy seekers. But actually... I embody that because I'm looking for fun. I'm looking for light and love mm. and laughter. And I'll do that until I die. Yeah. And it's integral to my to life itself. And I've just been so lucky that I've I understand it. I'm affected by it. I embody it. I share it. I receive it. It hasn't been something I've had to think about because it's just there mm. for the taking. You've got to be awake enough to feel it and see it, though. 
And where does the where does the book fall into that joy? You know, I mean, we're both recently published authors. I mean, it, it was a joyful experience for me, but it was also quite painful as well. I mean, to relive some of the events and tragedies in my own story. I, I, what about you? Have you have you found that experience uh, joyful? Oh, I mean, writing for me has always been something that I've been passionate about and done. I mean, I've written poetry, I've written a children's book, I wrote a comedy drama, none of them have ever been published, but I've got them all. So writing is joyful. Writing is an expression of my heart. I also feel very proud of my writing because I feel like it's truthful and honest. It's without um, sort of, you know, I didn't go to higher education, so it it, it, is, a, it is raw in its delivery which is a great blessing. Um, but the pain from writing the things um, was real also, because to get it on paper is to relieve it and release it from one's body. But then you have to process that, it, that in itself. And, and then it's like mining, isn't it? You mine for things, because even the, the book now, I could write another book about that same life with deeper in, in, in information that I've received since writing it. And also I've evolved since I wrote it too, because I wrote it a year ago. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly evolving and changing and I'm constantly processing the pain. And now everybody reading about that pain, I'm actually starting to be so grateful that people are starting to understand who I am in order to be able to do the work I want to do, you know, because I have been perceived really sometimes, I think is some kind of empty vessel and I am full of everything, you know? I can tell, I can tell it comes <laughs> <laughs> Melanie, I, I want to ask about uh, a little bit about the faith aspect, because this is the Godcast after all. Um, you write early in the book about um, kind of being raised in the Roman Catholic church and not necessarily enjoying the worship but but really enjoying the community um and the one of the first people I interviewed was Eamon Holmes who is, is a Roman Catholic and he he, he said to me uh, once a Roman Catholic always a Roman Catholic do, do you believe that is so uh, do you still have kind of well I suppose the question is do you think the Roman Catholicism has actually created you in, and drove you into the person you are now no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that specifically. Only because I wasn't brought up one hundred percent a Catholic. I didn't go to Catholic school. I didn't do. Um, see, I don't even know the terminology for it. But you know, when you, what is it that you, when you have to remember a load of lines and you get communion, not in order to get communion. What is yeah. it you have to do? You yeah, have to your pass an exam. Confirmation. Got to see exactly. I don't. I can't even find the word yeah. for it. And, and for me to remember things, I remember getting the confirmation book and having a look through it and thinking, I'll never remember this. I would never remember it. But I actually like the idea of being able to go and get communion. But I also felt like, why can't I get communion even if I can't remember stuff? I want to still go and get communion. Because when everybody got up to go and receive it, I, I felt like they were more special than me. And that's not true. Um. But I definitely have faith and I go to church a lot. I go to all churches because I like the buildings. I like mm. the smell. I like the stained glass windows. I don't know particularly the difference between all the different churches. But what I do know is when I enter them, I feel at home. And So but, I, yeah. But, but that's, that's, you're, you are a spiritual person, aren't you? I am. One, what, yeah, completely and utterly. And what's really beautiful about it is that the older I get, the more I tune into that, the more I become. But I also look back at my youth and realise I've always been that as well. I just didn't realise it. I've always prayed. I've always prayed. And and lately I've had had a bit of a... Um, and as people were attacking me as early as last week. And whilst I was curled up in a ball crying about the pain that these people were inflicting, I had great wisdom from it. And and I realised something else is that I hadn't been practising gratitude as often as I should. And when I do that and when I, I'm grateful for my ancestors and the people that came before me and what they showed me and who I am, I'm able to get off the floor and go about my mission with a full heart again 
and just practicing gratitude alone will get you off the floor and and obviously a dog because I now have a puppy who won't let me sit on the floor because <laughs> he'll just jump on my head <laughs> I think I think when you when you you know having read your book and and um you know I I'm very jealous because it seems like you're quite good mates with Chris Evans, who's a somebody I really, uh, really Annoying. enjoy. Yeah, you, yeah. Um, but you, you're clearly a lady of empathy. How, how do you deal with criticism then? Because um, generally, I th- I find with people who are naturally quite pastorally sensitive and kind, and you know that means that we we don't receive criticism very well. I, I know I struggle with it. I, I'm just being honest. But how about yourself? Well, I, I've I have armoured up um, energetically against that kind of stuff since I became famous, which was six, 26 years ago or maybe 25. I can't remember. My maths is terrible. But I all I know is that since my diagnosis and, and stripping of these uh, the, the 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 this armour that I can't. It hurts me. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting wounded on a moment to moment basis but I'm also having great joy moment to moment as well I'm completely in flow I'm so I'm more present than I've ever been in my life Mm. and I'm happy to go with the flow of the pain as well if that makes sense because it means I'm living and I'm living authentically but oh my god I am the pain is real and uh, people have people don't understand that, that there is invisible pain in others and we've got to be kind to everybody because we have no idea what somebody's going through and they might look like they're strong and they might look beautiful and they might look well turned out and they might have their head up high but inside mm. the heart's broken yeah I, I get that I, I kind of I think um authenticity is so important and I, I'm not sure how old you are, but it's actually my birthday today. I'm 54 today. Are you? And Happy birthday. I'm I'm 53 on the 7th of August, so I'm not far behind yeah. you. And do you know what? Um, I, I feel the most authentic that I've ever been as well at this stage of my life. You know, I used to have short hair. I never used to have a beard. Um, I used to, I, I have tattoos. I used to hide my tattoos. I always used to kind of car away. And I think um, I've come to the point in my life where I'm trying to be as authentic as I am. And actually, I'm probably as happy as I've ever been because of that. And I think it's really important for people to hear that because a lot of people try and live the life that other people want them to live and to be something yeah. different. Or yeah. they they have been so coerced early on to thinking that they've got to behave a certain way that they're just living out somebody else's um, societal creation. Yeah. And I, I did, for sure. I, I, I succumbed to it because because it happens but when you get on the other side of it and you look back and you think oh my gosh I've always had my natural instincts and that has popped up regularly for Mm. me and steered me so beautifully in the right direction it's when you ignore it you get into trouble yeah that inner voice that 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 knowledge that we are born with yeah. But being authentic in a world that is actually pretending is actually quite a dangerous space yeah. because people want to write you off as crazy or whatever terms that they use or attention seeking. I mean, I've been accused of um, giving myself diagnoses um, and it hurts other people that I've done that, but I can identify as whatever I want to without hurting anybody. I, I think so. I think so. I um, you know, I again in in my job, I I I'm quite open. I've never been diagnosed with depression, but I'm uh, fully aware that I tread a very fine line, and I think that actually helps people to hear that that you know, I don't have a diagnosis of depression, but I don't need one. It's what I feel, you know. Yeah, but also if you don't, because it's like people put a label on things like menopause and it's got a million things underneath it. And if you unpick it, you actually haven't got menopause as a whole. You've got a few issues here that you can actually practically take out. And it's the same with depression. It's not just one big slap of you are depressed. Why are you? What is it that triggers it? I've had to do the work on that over the years. Like I say, I've been in therapy since I was 25 and some therapists I wasn't even sharing the real me. And it's only now that I'm sharing the real me with somebody who understands me because she's a late diagnosed autistic woman. It's like the perfect 
uh, union once a week where I can explore all the real things and the, the atrocities that I, I see and feel and all the, and it's, it's just so healing to mm. talk. Yeah. Melanie, t- talking about authenticity, um, again, this is where I see another parallel in our lives. I want to talk about Boy George uh, because in the book you you write about uh, George and I've read his autobiography and I have, I have to say his autobiography is is probably the best autobiography. No, 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 no. How dare you? you know, How dare- Listen, it's Boy George. Is this, is it a new is it a new autobiography just brought out? Because no, I read his old one. It was one. the first one where he talks about his heroin addiction and his relationship right, but- with Marilyn and. But do you know he's bringing out a new one that no, is actually... He no. is writing the real one. <laughs> I read it recently. He's writing an autobiography that's actually the real one because he was telling you as much as he could tell you at that time. Right. And I remember reading it. I got him to sign it. He was a DJ at a club that I used to go to and I went up as a young 20-something with my book to get him to sign it and I don't even know where it is now. I've moved so many times. I don't know where it is. I lost it, which is just tragic. And I've met George, and he he used to scare me, but I love him. Why? You know, I've, why? I've, I because he's authentic. Because he was authentic. Because he was being himself. And it, and I say in the book, at a time when he was being vilified for drug taking, all I did as a fan was want to know that he was okay. Yeah. He didn't. It wasn't making me want to take heroin, as he was being accused of doing to his fans. But his fans, if they were anything like me, were just concerned for his well-being, <laughs> you know? And I'm always concerned for his well-being. I'm concerned for everybody's well-being. <laughs> but he's an extraordinary talent as well, isn't it? I think well, he-, he is that voice of an angel, but it's like Sinead, Sinead O'Connor, mm. another one. Another human that's just come into this world to share good messaging and to educate and you and and with with not only with a beautiful face with a beautiful heart and the voice to match and George is the same, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, victims. I think the song "Victims" is one of the greatest songs. Just yeah. I played that on repeat on on my record player <laughs> in my bedroom and cried and <laughs> cried and cried. He helped heal me. And I was too young to even realise what that was, but it was a release of pain that he helped me get to. And it's the same with Sinead, with Nothing Compares to You, if it's the only song you know ever, because it opened your heart. Some yeah. people don't even know why it opened their hearts, but it did, and it's yeah. just an amazing, amazing gift. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was very sad to hear about Sinead dying uh, as we record this this morning. Uh, yeah, me- me Melanie, as a, as a as a young person, you were you entered that that world of modelling. Did did you did you see the trajectory that you were going to take? Did did you see yourself mixing with the rich and famous, and and ultimately becoming one of them? Well, I'm not rich. <laughs> no, maybe, well, maybe not now, but you were. Well, you must have been. You know. Well, I, I have had money over time, but I've also been a breadwinner and I've also been very independent in that way. And so it's not been like a double income family or anything like that. So my money's been spent and I've also given it away and I've also invested in other people and it's also been stolen from me. So there's a big old story around financial life. But in terms of fame, I fa- I'm, my, fir- my um, second boyfriend was famous and I talk about him in the book as well and and I explain about fame I I saw fame up close and personal and it weren't pretty and I was only 19 so I certainly didn't think about getting to be famous and I didn't strive for fame I when I think you've brought it up and it's made me think I must have been very moment to moment because I used to say, why does everybody have like a five year plan or, you know, because what, what is it you want to do? I never knew I was happy with doing what I was doing today. Mm. And I kind of am like that apart from now, I have got some missions I'd like to accomplish based on the information I've gained in the past 52 years. And I'm healthy enough to be able to explore them now. Everything else has just been a stepping stone to now. Yeah. And and people who, who've not read your book, who've not seen you on the telly for a while, might be surprised to learn that you you didn't enjoy um, towards the latter end of your television working life. You were you were quite unhappy, weren't you? Yeah, but I did I did I enjoyed it for most of it, and it's obvious when I'm happy, and it, and and the rest is hidden. Um, but I retired from television um, 
well I started to retire about four years ago longer it's longer now really when I think about it and I don't want to return and never will return not until people are actually starting to put authentic broadcasting and messaging out that's real and important and loving and caring mm. because the mainstream media is poison poisonous yeah I, I agree and I, and I write about not necessarily the media but just society about how we, we need to be a bit more compassionate and and caring and we've lost that yeah because nobody, when... nobody's teaching it apart from in church and people don't go to church as much as it's it's such an amazing sorry to interrupt I just feel like it doesn't matter if you're religious or not the space is nurturing the space is about looking after your neighbor you know you need one of these on Melanie <laughs> I do I th I've thought about it I'm not even joking I've actually yeah. thought about it especially after reading your book and I and I not sort of well I laugh about everything but I spoke with a friend the other day how much I would like to be in service in that way and and at one time I wanted to be a therapist and to be honest I, I am a therapist I, I, I help people out every day and I always have because people always come to me with their problems and I always prescribe what I think they might need in little palatable chunks but I'm quite firm as well because I won't take nonsense if you've come to me for help and you want to listen you need to do it mm. don't want to keep you in the state that you're in I'm trying to pull you out of it and sometimes that's very strong how it comes out. So they might not want me with a collar on. <laughs> you know? Do you know what, Melanie? Uh, uh, an old ch well, he's, he, a guy said to me when he was fifty. I was, I was. This is probably twenty five years ago. He said, "I'll give you a tip, Alex." He said, "In in life, there are, there are very few friends that you'll make. You'll make lots of acquaintances." And I was like, "Oh, no, don't believe that." But actually, now now I'm in my fifties. I do think that's there's an ele uh, an element of wisdom about that. Um, I suppose uh, the media and TV world was a bit like that, was it? So what do you mean? Though? Well, were, were were there more acquaintances than friends? Were there people? No, who... I don't, no, 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 I, no. Because I'm really, I didn't have any friends in the business particularly. I had some key people that I absolutely loved, loved hanging out with when I was working with them. Occasionally call them, but I've not. As an autistic person, I just, I've never had loads of friends anyway. And, and, and also people, are, uh, it's not just a load, of, it's not like walking into a waxworks museum when you're famous, you know, it's not like this a con, a contents famous people party. You're working with loads of people, loads of people that make that one project come alive, you know, and that is everybody that works on it. So I've met some really amazing, creative, mm. um, um, inspiring younger people coming up in the business that now are in key positions that I've met now, you know, who are doing really amazing things. And, um, but you make friendships in your real life, I think. So, but you also make them at work. And then and then some you and I'm always evolving as well. And some people don't evolve. So I sort of found that I've had friends who I thought they were my guru and they've given me that one with one pearl of wisdom that I've picked and run run with and run past them. And I know it's not a competition, but that's helped me get to my next stage of thinking, but they're, they'll always just keep that one narrative that they have. Mm. I evolve past people at such a quick rate. And I don't want to be ashamed to say it because it isn't a competition. It's just a fact, mm. you know? I, I was going to just ask, I mean, the, the, the you know, you worked for ITV for a long time and all that recent stuff with, uh, Holly Willoughby and Philip Schofield and rather than making it about those as individuals what did you make of that kind of whole story were you in the background screaming or were you kind of unsurprised well, I, by all well I wasn't surprised that one person gets vilified and everybody else protects their asses. I mean that scapegoating crossed the board as far as I'm concerned and that's all I'll say on it really yeah so I was I I, I was I was in pain for Philip in a way because he just got scapegoated mm. with any without any real hard and fast facts about anything. It's a tough and one. I'm I'm always about people who are innocent until they're proven guilty, and that's not the case anymore. No, 
And and you say you you know you talk you you say how you you didn't enjoy it, but what about the fame? Did you enjoy? Be, you are still very famous. Do you enjoy being famous? No, it's horrible. It's an intrusion. It's a total intrusion. I mean, I've, I chart it in the book. The pain that I've had from people recognizing me, the inappropriate behaviour of people. Can you share something, Melanie? Well, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we say? Yesterday, I went out with a friend who I haven't had, been out with for ages and she got me out to have a coffee because I'm quite agoraphobic at the moment. And when the press attack me, I feel like I might get attacked in the street. So it's a real struggle for me to get out. So a friend came to pick me up, took me for a coffee. When I was leaving the cafe, some guy said something to me at the top of his voice, so inappropriate, so loud, so not anything that it was just bizarre. And I, I dealt with it in a way that I've always had to. It's like, have a nice day. Thanks very much. And walked on. And my friend was, she was apoplectic with rage. That he, how, rude he, how rude it was that had what he'd said. And that's how I feel every time it happens, but can't demonstrate it. What did he say? It was about my mental health. And he talked about it at the top of his voice in a way that was so... I didn't even know. I can't. I don't even want to repeat because then no. he'll 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 identify that it was him. And believe me, it happens all the time. Yeah. And um, inappropriateness that is so painful. And I'm walking away because I have learned to walk away. But it was interesting to see my face. But what I'm loving is that people are starting to witness what it is that I go through on a daily basis. I wouldn't be famous. My anonymity, I talk about the loss of my anonymity is the greatest loss of my life. And people don't believe me. Because to them, fame is like something. But mm. I've been there and it's nothing. Yeah. So, and I didn't I... do it to get famous. I, I went into TV because it was a job offer that was a good change for me to do at the age of 27 26 or 27 was to change because in those days that age was the kind of age you needed to think about wrapping up your modeling career because you were getting too old mm. so do you know when so, I was a kid when I was a kid Melanie I really wanted to be famous I was you know I was you? like yeah I really did and I was <laughs> and, and in the book you know I, I entered the world of stand-up comedy on that on that hope that I might be famous and little did I know that any notoriety I would come would have would come through uh, the the kind of the social work that I do, but I do yeah. get what you're saying a little bit. I'm I'm certainly not famous, but probably quite well known in in my own town. Yeah, and enough to that go I go and shop elsewhere because I just like a bit of <laughs> peace and quiet. So I do kind of get it, but I suppose people I suppose people might say, well, I, how can you say that when you know it's bringing in your money and it's giving you the lifestyle that you're accustomed to? But but I've spoke to but, but that's there but it's their perception, their perception of it it's not the reality is the point yeah everything everybody says to you is based on their limited beliefs it's not or unlimited beliefs mm. they go crazy with their beliefs and then believe that i mean it's not yeah. me and also just to go back to the fact of wearing a collar you can't you might feel like you you've got a bit of notoriety where you are but because you wear the collar you are actually of service to a community so you can't in a way pick and choose no. whereas I can yeah. I can you know and and I and I never used to say anything to anybody but now I do talk about you know just like I'm you know and even the media when I'm when I'm because I'm not in a relationship I'm I'm seen as some kind of fucking excuse my French curiosity I'm a curiosity mm. because I'm really speaking my truth i'm embracing my neurodivergence divergency in a way that is just magical for me and i feel like it's going to help a lot of people and i'm single whilst doing it mm. and that's like what you know it's just so out it's weird it's so strange though because i'm just living my life and trying to raise a couple of boys and mm and and survive this whilst helping people yeah and we haven't even touched on that neurodiversity and, and people again who are a bit out of touch not not been uh, checking the bookshelves and uh booksellers that you know that you you were diagnosed with autism how long ago was that melanie 
uh, it's, it's, I think it's coming up to two years ago, and 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 my main message is, and from what I understand of me and what I understand of my study, is that you don't have autism, you, you are autistic. You your brain is wired a different way. It is not a disease, and it is not a disorder. There are loads of pre-existing conditions that go with autism that make manifest in look like disabilities and feel like disabilities, but autism itself. Is just a way in which you think a lot of autistic people are highly empathetic, really care about the truth and and don't, aren't afraid to say it. But when they're stopped from saying it, that's when the pain kicks in. And that denial of spirit, that denial of voice is really hard to take. So people talk about oh well they don't you know autistic people that they, they, they they've no filter they've no filter and I keep saying why are we filtering what we think and feel mm. why is that good that's the neurotypical world that do that mm. who hide what they think and feel and look where it's got them we're just now in a capitalist society. It's all about money. It's not about heart and soul and survival and looking after your fellow man. And that comes from blanket numbing people. How, it does. How, uh, how important was that diagnosis for you and, and, and how good was it? Oh, my gosh. It was heaven sent. Heaven sent. It was a hallelujah. Really, truly. Even discussing that I was autistic was it relieved me of all my pain before I even got the diagnosis. That's why if you identify, it's because you are. If something tells you, somebody gives you a bit of information, you think, God, that resonates with me, that's me, then you are that. Mm. You, because, because that is you. And so, yes, it's just been, it saved my my life in a way so where does that bring you now melanie tell us about life outside of um television are, are you content are things good yeah because that because i'm i'm not in atrocious or awful painful situations so yeah i got myself out of it you know i got myself out of it life life is good but now i'm in a different zone where i'm an independent speaker I have no alignment with any mainstream. I can say and do as I please, and the message is only love. And in that, I'm getting destroyed by people, but I realise I was meant to do this, so I have to keep getting up and keep moving forward with my message until I die. Mm. And it'll either be at the hands of them or not, but I will be fighting the good fight until I die. Are you a forgiving person, Melanie? Yeah, I forgive everyone. You know what I learned to do when I meditate as well, and I learned this through meditation, is it's sometimes they'll say, think about um, a neighbour and just send all the love to a neighbour, and then it'll say, send love to somebody that hurt you. And when I very first heard that, I was in my meditation going, I'm not bloody doing that. And then I suddenly thought, the worst the person that really hurt me the most, and I sent love to him, and I send love to everybody always yeah. it's a fallback position for me now do you know melanie why i'm asking you that is that we've we have we have lots of people who are quite hurt who come to our church and some of them find it really difficult to forgive because no. of the damage and the hurt that's gone on to them yeah. and, and i always say to them you know forgiveness is a wonderful thing to be able to do it's not easy no. but just, can you can you encourage people uh, maybe yeah. offer some wisdom Right, no, I well, God, I mean, wisdom, that just flags it up as I've got to say something really bloody wise, so don't put that pressure on me. But one of the things I will say, I mean, I've always, I've, I've, I've got a really bad memory as well, so I forget the pain that I've experienced, which helps with the forgiveness. <laughs> but ultimately, holding pain hurts you. And I, I realise when anything has ever come into my life that has really, really wanted to take me down, I have to dig deep and find out why I allowed it, why I didn't love myself enough to, to stand up for myself and work on that. Use all your energy on working on that. Because that person 
is not you. It, they have their own, and it's man, women, it's everyone that hurts you. And some people it's hard to deal with when it's family members, because we all know families are complicated too, and that blood that binds. And then there's relationships we have with lovers or friends or whatever, but ultimately you are only responsible for what you allow to happen but not to feel guilty about that. I'm not victim blaming. I'm not saying mm. that. I'm just saying you've got to heal yourself by loving yourself and, and, and evolving and changing into something that you truly are. Mm. It's, it's really good. It's really good advice. Melanie, I've loved, I've loved, I've loved every minute of chatting to you. You're so, <sighs> so grounded. You've got a real heart of gold. You're a, you're a, you, you strike me as a really lovely lady. I've, Thank I've really you. enjoyed it. Um, oh, thanks. I've I've enjoyed talking to you. I just want to ask you about one of my heroes who you work with a lot, and and that is Des O'Connor. Oh yeah. Um, I, talk about growing up on Boy George. Um, my dad uh, used to get the he used to buy Des's vinyls, so we were we were fans of his music. You know, really. Uh, we still have them, and I've got an old Technics record deck behind me, and. Just tell us about Des. I've been looking for some Des O'Connor vinyl, by the way. Oh, well, I've got it. <laughs> oh, wow. And you know what? I'm not trading it's, it. <laughs> oh, well, okay, fine. But it's hard to find. It's yeah. actually really hard to find. And I've started to listen to vinyl a lot. So uh, because of the, um, um, the feeling that comes mm. from needle on vinyl, mm. the feeling is real the best and it's the best it's the best so so des yeah des des's voice for me was um not when i was younger when i'm when i knew him when i knew him and every time he sang on the show my heart would just open <laughs> and um he it's interesting when i think about des because he was always about good news he didn't want anything on the show that was negative we would look for the silliest stories in the newspapers to to have fun with and it was interesting because back at the back in the day as much as I loved all the fun I did think you know there's some serious stuff going on we never talk about it not that I was even at the capacity to deal with it back then but he was always looking for the positive Des he just wanted to celebrate humor and positivity and the light that can be in life and that is there if you want to look at it mm -hmm. and focus on it. And do you miss he, him now? Yeah, I think I think about him a lot. I think about him a lot. I speak to his wife a lot. We're trying to get some of the Des and Mel's that are all on VHS. We're trying to get them digitally somewhere so we can use them for whatever we need. And I miss him and I think of him in the way that I miss Paul O'Grady. And I didn't have a cl as, as close as it was with Des in some respects, but close in others. And grief is a really interesting thing. And again, people don't even think that I might be grieving anything because you grieve all sorts during your life, don't you? Not mm -hmm. just deaths of people, but actually situations. And that's where we all have to really take care of each other, isn't yeah. it? Well, I think grief is a whole podcast in itself. It, it, uh, it really is. Yeah. It really is. And it's been, it's extraordinary. But all I know is that every time I hear Des's voice or see a picture of him when I'm going through my stuff or have a memory of something, it's only good. It's only love. And it's only a yeah. big smile on my face. You know, I'm not, he, he, he was here for good. Yeah. That's you lovely. Know? Let's, um, let's finish by plugging the book here it is well go on then <laughs> melanie sykes autism and all the things i've left unsaid illuminated yeah it's, it's um it's really lovely and and if you listen to this on the podcast you can't see this but it's a really lovely uh blue color and then inside is a lovely bit of artwork did you do that artwork melanie is that no that, that's that's a friend of mine eileen cooper and i Beautiful. wanted her on the cover but actually now i feel like it glows from the cover of the book i feel like it's yeah. almost like a bible in itself and you open it and that glows really and, lovely and that is just a woman in moonlight naked raw natural in moonlight and that's me and that's a lot of us and it's all of us really so so yeah, I'm so happy you enjoyed it. And yeah. there's an audio, there's an audio book too, which I which I did the voice for in case people don't like reading or for whatever reason, there is that too, which was a is a story in itself. But I know you've got to go, and I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. It's been lovely chatting to you. Um, if you want to get Melanie's book, it's on all uh, platforms. It's in Waterstones, all the major booksellers. 
And if you're interested in myself, you'll find my book there as well, Our Daily Bread from Argos to the Altar, which is published by Harper North as well. Yeah, Melanie... brilliant. But it's a brilliant book, by the way, and I can't wait to see you again. I'll let you know when I'm up north. Yeah, well, I'll make you a brew. <laughs> yes, please. All Thank right. you so Take much. Care. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.